But right now we're going to take you in for the lunchtime session with Kellogg and Kresge Foundations called Hope Starts Here, Detroit's Early Childhood. And all the good things that we, the momentum that we have in the city of Detroit, how sustainable will that be without schools that work? And as we saw in the video just now, Detroit parents who were on the video, they want what all of us would want for our own kids, a world-class community in which to raise their children. That's why it is so historic that the state's two largest foundations, W.K. Kellogg and Kresge Foundation, create, have created an unprecedented partnership to focus on early childhood. And that's before you hit kindergarten. That is from infant to four years old. Uh, it's a community engagement and planning process, as you heard. They're gonna unveil an action plan this summer, later this summer, but you're gonna have the appetizer today, kind of the structural, why this is important, and you'll have a better understanding of how you can engage when the plan is, is rolled out later this summer. This is for all kids in the city of Detroit. The researchers tell us that the early years, those early years before the kid even hits kindergarten, are really important. That, and that, that the children under stress suffer damage to the early architecture of their brains. The tiny brains are developing one million neural connections that support learning and skills every second. So think about the stress that you had as a child. We ran out of grape jelly and I couldn't make my PBJ, you know? And the, the, the stressful things I had as a child, I can't even imagine the stress that so many children in Detroit face. Some kids go to school to eat. That is why they show up. They live in single parent homes or with a grandparent because a parent is in prison or suffering from mental illness or just is unable to take care of them. Hope Starts Here is gonna focus on interventions and services to catch children before they fall. Quality early childhood, as you heard in the video, with a stable workforce of child care providers. Imagine that, people who are well paid to take care of one of the most precious, precious, precious resources. So this plan's gonna be announced later this summer, but today we're gonna to hear more about the plans and the investments. But, and, uh, but before we call the panel up, just a little, so they understand who's in the room, um, let me ask, are there stu uh, stewardship board members who are supporting this initiative? If you're, if you're here, please stand. Thank you. Now, how many of you represent nonprofit, non-government organizations? Show of hands. Okay, a good, a good number. How many are in public or private education? Okay. Now, how many are private sector for-profit employers? We need more, we need more. So, how many of you, whether you work for a nonprofit or work for a for-profit, when you're hiring a new employee with young children, how many of you recommend living in the city of Detroit as a great place to raise a family? A few, okay. What we're gonna to hear today are cities that have become good places to raise children. Philadelphia, Boston, Miami-Dade County. Some of the things that they're doing and how they're positioning their cities to be great places for children and for families. So now I'm gonna ask the panel to come to the stage. Um, Mayor Mike Duggan, does he need an introduction? Not really. Please join us, Mike. Um, And two of the folks who are on our cover of the Crane Special Report, if you haven't seen it, it's gonna be distributed in the theater this afternoon. Rip Rapson, CEO of the Kresge Foundation, a change maker for how philanthropy has worked in Detroit, a Crane's change maker. <laughs> Lejeune Montgomery Tabron, CEO of the W.K. Kellogg Foundation. She has made racial equity a pillar of the state's largest foundation's work. She's a Detroit expat, and she will later this year receive the Michigan Executive of the Year Award oh. from Wayne State University's Mike Illich School of Business. Yeah, I know that. And the Reverend Larry Simmons, Executive Director of the Brightmore Alliance, a neighborhood that has had challenges, but has such remarkable resilience and likely is going to be a key player in the Hope Starts Here initiative. 
Now, everybody has cards at the table. So as we start this conversation, and we are on a tight time frame because they need the room at 1.15, so we are going to be clicking along here. Um, start forming your own questions and raise, raise the card so somebody can pick it up and get it to me. But let's start. Mayor Duggan, I, want, I have the first question for you. Um, when Paul W. asked you about fixing the schools yesterday, um, I, it really made me think that today would be a good time for you in this session to hear your vision for how do you make Detroit a great place to raise a young family? Uh, well, I want to thank uh, Rip and Lejeune for what they have done uh, in taking this issue on. Uh, and, you know, we're talking about Detroit, but I got to tell you, if you're looking at what's happening mm -hmm. in the achievement in the public schools in almost every district in this state, the problem runs a lot deeper uh, than Detroit. And, and here's where I see the problem. Uh, I see a state legislature where I know people individually who are great parents, which if you uh, uh, had a pay cut, if you had cut back on your hours and you had to skimp, the last thing in the world you would skimp on is your children. They wanted to be on that sports team, they wanted that dance class. You as parents would find a way. And yet in this state, we'll try and cut income taxes when we don't have pre-K, uh, in nearly enough uh, areas where we don't have the funding we need uh, in our schools. And somehow you get a whole bunch of really good parents and you put them up there collectively and they do as a state what none of us would do as individuals, which is make the first cuts to the children. Uh, and certainly we've seen that uh, in the city of Detroit. You know, the, in, in the city, times got tough. They closed most of the rec centers. Uh, the year before I got elected, they did not cut the grass in any of the city parks. This is hard to believe, but in 2013, the summer grass across the city was that high. A neighbor would take out a lawnmower and cut a strip of grass from the start of the park to the swing set. And the kids would walk through grass up to their shoulders. And you say, what are we saying uh, about, uh, about our children? And so, you know, to me, the issue is a question for all of us. Who are we as a state? Do you ever think we'd see the day where 41st or 42nd in student achievement, public schools, uh, were the pride uh, of this state? And so uh, what you got here are some foundations who said, we're gonna start somewhere. Uh, and we're gonna start with the, the children in the early stages. Uh, and I'm glad to be supportive of them, but I think we need to be talking uh, when you're talking about education, not about Detroit, we need to be talking about the public school system, the entire state. So Lejeune, you grew up in Detroit, and I just um, I'm curious how you might compare your experience as a child to what the typical experience is today for an early child, for someone who has not yet started kindergarten. Mm -hmm. yeah. So uh, I think this is my moment to really change the narrative about what Detroit can be for a child because I had a great experience in the city of Detroit as a student. I and I actually went back and I looked. At that moment in the 60s, Detroit had over 74% employment. It was a thriving city. My parents migrated there from the north looking for job opportunities and they were given those opportunities. My neighborhood when I grew up was a mixed neighborhood. Unfortunately, uh, it did transition. I actually remember the moment when my neighbors, the Hefleys, came to our home and sat down and told us why they had to move, and Ben and Jennifer, my friends, would no longer be my friends. Mm -hmm. But I lived in this transitional period. My education was solid. I had teachers who cared. I had teachers who cared about every child. Uh, and I had a great high school experience, which was rich with career development, career advancement. I actually majored in accounting in high school, at huh. Cass Technical High School. That's what the schools <laughs> used to be. <laughs> you technicians so, in the room. Absolutely, go <laughs> <Always>. CT. <laughs> My point is, uh, this city has developed very capable uh, students, and they've been able to pursue whatever career path they have 
desired. And it has been the adults that has addressed, that is really, uh, I think, disrupted a system to the point where now it is dysfunctional. And that's why we at the Kellogg Foundation are here and wanting to be a part of this. When we stepped into the grand bargain, we knew that that was unfinished business for the city of Detroit, that that was just one piece of a revitalization strategy that had to start with its children and its neighborhoods. So that's why we, here, we are here today, and I know it's possible because I experienced some of the best education in the city of Detroit. Thank you. So Rip, uh, Kresge is known for some pretty big plays in the city, um, <laughs> transformational plays like the Riverfront, the Q Line, uh, and arts and culture. So why is this initiative important to you? And can you give a little bit of um, a description, give us a taste of what the structure might be in terms of the, uh, the outcomes or the investments? Uh, hmm. The you know the transformational investments that Kresge has tried to contribute to in the city of Detroit ultimately have to be about the people and uh, a queue line, a riverfront, a campus Martius Park, a neighborhood park only take you so far. Ultimately, you have to try to figure out how to give these uh, smallest of our residents uh, an opportunity to take full advantage of those amenities, and I. You know, if I if I could, you know, we're flanked by kind of in many ways the reason we believe early childhood is that sort of transformational pivot. Um, I worked many many years ago for a mayor in Minneapolis who uh, identified kids and families as his top priority. People at that point just poo pooed that. They thought it was about fixing roads and building bridges, and he said it's about all of those things, of course but it's also about the human capital of our community. And over the next decade, he literally transformed Minneapolis into the kind of place where you would want to raise a kid. I have every confidence that Mayor Duggan will do that in an even more spectacular way. Anyone who has watched him work knows that when he gets on an issue, um, get out of the way, because it's, it's a, a powerful thing to watch. <laughs> um, and I think similarly, you have in, in Lejeune and in the Kellogg Foundation, arguably the nation's premier philanthropy focused on early childhood and, and young people. And the opportunity to bring those resources, not just monetary resources, but intellectual resources, experiences from other places, into the mix in Detroit in a, in a powerful way, um, I think is, is unprecedented. So I think we have a moment in this community. We've been talking, I was looking out at the, audience, and I realize we have people in this audience who've been talking about early childhood development for decades, probably. This is our moment to move off the dime. I'm just absolutely convinced. I participated in a similar moment in Minneapolis. You can feel it. You can tell it. And I think the mayor is right. You've got to work the legislature. Lejeune is right. She, talk, she will talk about um, working deeply with community. You have to work with providers. I mean, it's just, it, it is a time when all of those things will coalesce. So. Just a couple of things I think you can expect to see. One is uh, the stewardship board that you've been introduced to. I think it's a community-based set of um, uh, ties back into community to make sure that what we're doing is deeply grounded in community voice and community identity and community aspiration. Uh, second, I think you're going to see a series of funds set up to help rehabilitate, renovate, and in some cases create uh, child care centers of, high, of the highest quality. Third, I think we're going to try to figure out how to make sure we get universal screening for our young people at various stages in their development from birth and at other key milestones. Uh, fourth, I think you'll see the opportunity for us to create supports for professionals working in this area to develop themselves, to connect with one another. Uh, and fifth, I think we'll figure out one way or another how to finance all of this. It's very complicated and uh, different places have done it differently, um, but we, I think, are confident as a stewardship board that that's sort of directly on our plate and we got to solve for it. We're going to get into some of the funding ideas later, but uh, Larry, you're a pastor in Brightmore, you're the executive director of the Alliance in Brightmore, and uh, you know, one of the key phrases I think about this as initiative are the words community engagement. This is not top down, you're part of this process. Yes. How do you think this Hope Starts Here is gonna land in Brightmore? Hmm. I think it's gonna be very welcomed in Brightmore. Um, 
You know, I look down at the panel and I see the mayor of the city of Detroit with about $4 billion annual budget, Mr. Mayor. I, I wish. <laughs> <laughs> That's Lejeune's annual budget. <laughs> <laughs> some more billions with Rip and some more billions with Lejeune. And then there's me. <laughs> and the reason I'm here is because I pray bright more. <laughs> We work in the neighborhood at the ground, and the reason I am confident and certain that this partnership is going to make a difference is because when we work with parents, what we call personal power, every parent I have dealt with, some of them have been substance abusers, some of them are returned citizens, some of them have not worked in decades, every single parent I have ever worked with has wanted their child to do better than them. That personal power combined with the public policy that's being promoted here is going to transform our communities. It's going to be welcome. When people know better, they do better. We call it the uh, no act, circle back. <laughs> if you know something, you're going to act on something, and then you circle back to see, do I know any more? Did I do any better? So by using this approach, I believe that we're going to transform early education, and that is key. We're talking about 10 years, for those of you in business, that's 40 quarters. So 40 quarters, and you know you can't get the payoff at the 40th quarter if you don't make the investment in the first one. So I'm here, clearly because I do not have any billion dollars, I'm here because I represent the billions of hopes of the children on the ground and their parents who are today willing to do whatever it takes to see their children be that technology genius that we saw in the movie. Thank you. So, so, so Mary, I think, I think we're done. <laughs> That's so funny. So, <laughs> Mayor Duggan, you said you've got to engage the, the state legislature. What, what do you need from the legislature hmm. to make early childhood? Not so much, we're not talking so much about the Education Commission, which I know you still want to get through, but, um, but the early childhood piece, what would you like to see? You know, I think uh, uh, pre-K is something that should be uh, emphasized in a, a significant way, but when you don't have uh, your elementary schools funded, it's hard to go up and make a case uh, for pre-K, but we also need uh, to take advantage of some of the assets that we have, and it's, uh, you know, one of the issues and one of the things that we've kicked off is something that we're calling sister friends because if your baby is born premature, say earlier than 32 weeks, the chance of that child having long-term uh, learning issues is three or four times higher than if you take the baby to term. And in the city of Detroit, the only branch of the National Institute of Health that exists in the Midwest is in Detroit, it's the perinatal a research branch, and it is the leading world research on preventing preterm birth. And the woman that runs it, Dr. Sonia Hassan, goes to Russia, goes to France, goes to Italy, and they take all the latest research, and it's being implemented all through Europe. And I said to her one day, we've got an infant mortality rate and a preterm birth rate double the suburbs. How about you stay home? <laughs> uh, and we take all of this learning. And so she started this program called Make Your Date, where we start to reach out to doctors and get them to implement these protocols. And you know what we found? These 16, 17-year-old uh, pregnant moms, they don't really trust the government. They don't trust the hospitals. They don't trust the institutions. So now you've got the greatest research in the world in the heart of a city where these kids are being born early and have learning defects the rest of their lives. And so we have a new health director, uh, Dr. Joan A. Keldoon is going to go down as one of the great health directors in Detroit. Joan A., stand up. I want to see her. Uh, <laughs> so Joan A. is starting this program that she calls Sister Friends, where you take women from the community who volunteer to partner with a pregnant mom and be their partner through the pregnancy and one year after, one sister friend to one mom. So you can take women who are knowledgeable, who have street experience, life experience, who want to bond, meet once a week, we get them free transportation, we explain, not a, not a doctor telling them what to do, but their friend. 
and we go to get this started, but there's not funding in the state of Michigan for these kinds of health initiatives and preventing preterm birth. So normally, my friends in the foundation are as bureaucratic as government, but in this case, Lejeune, <laughs> Lejeune listens to one presentation of this story, commits $2 million, and we're rolling sister friends out. Uh, and so... Uh, Rip, can you top it? So I don't want to step on Jonay's announcement <laughs> and later the next month, which I've just kind of done. Uh, <laughs> but the fact is, we have people doing workarounds because fundamental things like child health, pre-K education, which ought to be funded and shouldn't be a huge struggle, they're enormous lifts. And it keeps us uh, from really focusing our energy uh, on the children. It's something that needs to change. That sounds like a very innovative program. And I know that the grant makers in the room, Lejeune, you, Kellogg gives grants nationally around the world. Kresge gives grants all over. What, what other kinds of things have you seen in other cities that are like this sister friend idea that would really make a difference in Detroit? So one of the things I wanted to share was uh, in 2001, we funded an effort that was called Securing Partnerships to Assure Ready Kids. It was an early childhood education uh, initiative. Seven states really wanting to understand how you improve the transition of children from uh, before kindergarten into kindergarten and how you engage an entire community around uh, protecting that child from birth into that transition into kindergarten. Uh, seven states, there were some very successful outcomes. I wanna start out just talking about the Children's Trust in Miami-Dade, Florida. Mm -hmm. Some of you may have heard of the Children's Trust. They were one of our spark sites. Through that initiative, they were able to, through an engagement strategy, engage their citizens to vote on an additional tax that is used exclusively for early child care in Miami-Dade County. The fund is growing. It ensures that every child has access to quality care. They also determined that there needed to be partnerships, and you can't do this without those partnerships, so you actually had to create a network of collaborating entities to work in this area. And then you finally had to make sure that the transition between the pre-K experience into kindergarten was sound and that there was uh, an alignment of instruction, curriculum, and understanding of data. So that's one example. I think Philadelphia is another example, and we're gonna hear from Mayor, Mayor Nutter later today, but they actually created an entire effort for their city to ensure that every child uh, had a great quality early experience and they created a funding mechanism. So what we're learning from all of these efforts, and there are many more to share and I don't have time, but it has to be a comprehensive approach. You have to have all of the people in the room, including residents and citizens and people who are in the actual uh, experience of taking their children to school. But then you also have to have the business community because this is also a workforce issue. One of the, the largest numbers that I've uh, encountered is the $3 billion annually that businesses lose due to absenteeism and productivity because people are looking for places for their children. So this is, it has to be seen as more than daycare. It has to be seen as the fundamental structure in a community that allows a community to thrive, be it the, the public system, the school system, and the business and the economy uh, environment that is happening in that space. Larry, can you talk a little bit about um, the Brightmore community and its early childhood um, work? Uh, I know the Fisher Foundation has been involved as well. Just if maybe a couple of concrete examples of things that you're doing that play into this strategy. Uh, the Fisher Foundation has been a phenomenal partner with Brightmore, uh, particularly around the question of early childhood. They initiated a program uh, several years ago in which they went to many of the child care providers in the neighborhood and they uh, began a program of training and upgrading both the 
leadership in business uh, skills, the staff in childcare skills, so that of the, and I think I'm gonna get this number wrong, of the dozen or so providers in the neighborhood, I think 90% uh, of them are quality rated childcare programs. People actually move out of the neighborhood but come back mm -hmm. to bring their children there as a result of the Fisher family mm -hmm. and the Fisher Foundation's work. Uh, we also have what we call a Brightmore Building STEAM in which we have recruited child care centers all the way up to high school students to work on building and creating technology. And this, a couple of weeks, in fact, it'll be a, uh, this Thursday, we'll be doing a big demonstration day where the kids get to show off what they've been working on all year. Uh, there's a, uh, while there's a great deal going on, I will, I'm going to go back to my uh, no act circle back. Most of the parents who love their children don't have a clue mm -hmm. about how to uh, most healthily raise their children. My children are healthy adults solely by the grace of God. Mm -hmm. <laughs> because what I was doing, well-intentioned, many of the things I was doing were, they were just very poorly conceived. They were not healthy for my children. Mm -hmm. People don't know. so. Part of our work is, I went to the community in uh, 2015, uh, 2016, uh, and asked, okay, if poverty, which we believe is, a, is the problem that's besetting this community, Brightmore is seven miles square, 23,000 people, 50% uh, of them, uh, round numbers, are below 125% uh, uh, of poverty, 70% uh, are below 200%, which is now considered to be a living wage. So it's a very poor community. We have some members who actually are living at 75% of the 1964 poverty line, which is uh, hard to believe. So the community, and this is why I believe that this effort is going to be so well received at the ground level. When I ask the community, tell me, what can you do as an individual to ensure the prosperity of our children? What could those near you do? What could the Brightmore Alliance do? What could policymakers do? Four questions. 55% of the respondents name things which they individually, personally could do. Mm -hmm. The community is eager to do what's necessary to create upward mobility for their children. They just don't know. And so this effort combined with trained professionals helps to create that opportunity. The other thing is there are 1,000 children in Brightmore. Uh, there are only 300 slots. Mm -hmm. So once they know that their children need to be in these high quality situations, there are insufficient slots today, which is why we need universal health care. So let me take on my preacher hat for a minute and say there are three things that we want you all to know, hopefully, and will remember from this, from this day. The well-being of children is unfinished business. Say that. Well-being of children well -being is unfinished business. <laughs> That's number one. Number two, investing in early childcare is a smart investment. Give you a number. The Wilder study, which the Fisher Foundation funded, said that the payoff for a lifetime of preparing a child to enter school ready to learn is $100,000 in Detroit and $39,000 statewide. You can find this report on the Fisher Foundation website. It's good business. Lejeune mentioned the billions of dollars lost by parents trying to find a decent place to train their children. So the first one is, it's unfinished business. It's what? Unfinished business. Second, is good public investment. Say public investment. Good, good public investment. Yes. And then the last one that I want to emphasize is it's going to take all hands on deck. I don't care if your area of expertise is substance abuse, if it's modeling uh, cars, if it's preaching in the pulpit, if it's working at home, 
everybody in Michigan needs to put their hands on this wheel because it's going to take all of us to get it done. Somebody say, all of us to get it done. All, all of us, us to get, get it, done. it done. Thank you. I'm done. So, <laughs> no, I think, I think you need to tell them what, what time you preach on Sunday. Got, <laughs> oh, yeah, that's I right. That's right. A new, a couple. <laughs> I'm blowing my own message. <laughs> so one of the questions from the audience, and, and I'll throw this out to, to the whole panel, how do you improve early childhood language and literacy rates with such a high illiteracy rate among parents? Mm. That I, I think there's a hesitancy mm. when you want you to read to your child, mm. how do you get even that mm. to build those vocabularies when there are challenges even among the, the parents themselves? Mm -hmm. Lejeune, do you want to yeah. take that? I'll take that. Um, first of all, that's real. Uh, and, you know, it's not just in the city of Detroit, it's across the country. And it's, I've heard a parent actually say, you know, how am I supposed to do this? Uh, but I think part of the things that we've tried and I think is, is very relevant for the city of Detroit is to have a, a place where you are bringing the parent and the child mm -hmm. into the environment and so that it's really comfortable for that parent to learn while the child is learning. So those dual generation strategies, I think, are very key to this. Mm -hmm. One of the things that we funded, uh, particularly in the city of Detroit, as well as all over the country, is a nurse-family partnership. Mm -hmm. Those home visitations where they will go to your home and sit down with the parent and the child and I think nurse family partnership is really successful because they're not just talking about education, they're also looking at the health issues. And they will do screenings, they will talk to the parent, they will teach the parent how to read to the child, but it's an experience where it doesn't intimidate the parent, it doesn't embarrass the parent, and it brings them into a learning environment where they can thrive as well. And then we can continue to touch that parent because now we know. Yeah. that the parent needs additional skills as well. Rip, you talked about interventions or uh, um, uh, evaluations at different points, key points. Um, some, of the, some of that might include, uh, this is another question for, from the audience, uh, uh, support systems for households with children that might have special needs. And the special needs might not be physical disability, but developmental because mm -hmm. of whatever the issues were, whether it was uh, um, early um, uh, pre premature birth or whatever. So is that part of the strategy here to make sure that there's services and these things are identified? Well, it has to be. This has got to be about all Detroit's kids, not just some Detroit kids. And one of the things that I think it needs to be reiterated is that if this were just um, an alliance between Kellogg and Kresge, it would be one thing, it would be welcome and we would do our best, but it's gotta be an alliance with community. I mean, there's just too much good work already being done, too much good energy being spent. But it also needs to, to really tie up as closely as we possibly can to what the mayor is doing. There is no way that we can be the public health department, and yet, um, and, there are, and yet there are ways in which I think we can be helpful to the public health department. As you develop programs, you know, sort of linking those with what we're trying to do, trying to figure out how to do screening. The Kresge Foundation doesn't do early childhood screening. Somebody competently trained and, and <coughs> stewarded needs to be watching over that. And people like the Henry Ford Health System, we've got right in the back, right as sitting on our, our stewardship board, it's almost impossible for me to imagine cracking this code without doing what Lejeune just talked about, which is sort of integrating it fully into the healthcare system. And, and that involves everything from early maternal care to screening to all sorts of community-based supports that only a sophisticated, comprehensive uh, medical system can provide, and whether that's Henry Ford or DMC or St. John's. I mean, these are all kind of got to be in the mix. And, you know, you can swamp yourself by taking on too much. But if you work from the sort of the inside out, I think you end up creating sort of adjacencies that make sense. So if you start with the premise that um, every childhood needs to be ready to enter the schoolhouse, uh, uh, ready to learn developmentally, academically, emotionally, then it seems to me you begin building all sorts of supports, whether it's kids with special needs, whether it's early maternal health, whether it's basic childcare services. And I think that's the way you build a system because I think what we have is 
a lot of activity and no system. And you can overwork that term, but here a system is really important. These dots need to be connected, otherwise we're gonna be spinning our wheels for a, a long time. So, Mayor Duggan, um, you have the uh, example of the, the new sister one-on-one -on -one program with, with, uh, with pregnant women. Um, how, uh, and, and the foundations clearly want to align whatever this initiative does with your, your programs, your offices, your, your, your existing work and your team, how do you fund this? I mean, what do you see in other cities? Hmm. What do you think might be possible in Detroit? You, you know what's so interesting, and, and I, this is what I think is terrific with Rip and, and Lejeune at the same time, I was just trying to get the buses to run on time. Yeah. Uh, they, they come in and say, uh, okay, uh, pre-K uh, is nowhere, uh, early outreach to parents nowhere, programs the city doesn't have at all. Uh, and and what you're, the question you're asking is right. You want to weave this all together. You want to talk about a child's experience mm -hmm. from the day they're born till the day they hit school. And it's like, I don't have a department of, of Pre, uh, you know, preschool uh, services. Many of those services are, are vested in the state of Michigan in some of the social programs and some of the health programs. Some are in our health department. Some are in private agencies. And what Rip and Lejeune came in and said, okay, uh, someday you've got to have a department uh, that coordinates these services. And we do. They said, let us get started and let us start to put the pieces together. And this is what their Hope Starts Here is doing, is saying, okay, what are all the different pieces uh, that we need? And so I don't know what the answer is gonna be at the end of the day. In Philadelphia, uh, Mayor Kenny uh, came into office and he went, goes to a city council uh, and says, I want a tax increase on soda pop uh, to pay for these things. Well, in uh, the state of Pennsylvania, city council can levy such a tax. In the city, uh, the state of Michigan, local government can't levy any tax without a vote of the people, and something like a soda tax or a stadium ticket tax requires a legislative act. And so, as we start to look through options, the funding options are gonna take some kind of state action. If you go to the state today and say, I want more funding or I want taxing authority, they're not gonna listen to us. But if this project has a comprehensive plan for the raising of children, and we say, here's what the foundations will do, here's what the city can do, here's what the county can do, here's what the state can do, here's what private sector can do, and we come in together, I think we have a chance. And I, I just think it's brilliant the way they're going about this. They're building the plan uh, that we will at some point come in and say, okay, this is the right amount of service, uh, and here's how we, uh, we fund it, and uh, when's the plan gonna be ready? <laughs> <laughs> It's three o'clock. Yeah. <laughs> but, that, but that is what you've taken on, right? Yeah. yeah. Yes. yeah. I mean, it's, I think it's just terrific that they did this. Yeah. Lejeune, you, you had a, um, a point about Miami-Dade and, and how they, they structured something. Um, I think there's a couple of other programs or projects that the Kellogg Foundation has been aware of or been involved with. Um, Chattanooga and the Bronx, you want to mm -hmm. talk a little mm -hmm. bit about those? Yeah, um, I think in all of our cases, what we've been doing is really, um, it's always been the same formula. And I think what I really wanna talk about is that formula of bringing people together first mm -hmm. and listening to them and hearing what their needs are. And in, in one case, this was, um, in, in Chambliss is the name of the, the institution, but the most important thing they could do was provide 24-7 care mm. as it relates to child care. Because what we learned from people in the community was that mm. the parents actually needed a non-traditional structure. And what people were providing was this nine to five uh, structure that didn't accommodate. And so just learning and putting in place a 24-7 quality care all of a sudden created the access that parents were looking for. So I think what we always try to do is not arrive anywhere with a cookie cutter approach, but to actually learn what the actual needs are and then to structure support that aligns with that. The interesting thing today, I was speaking with Kalia, one of our staff members, as we, in this effort, we've spoken to over 
2.5 million people through digital strat strategies, and we've spoken one-on-one -on -one to over 12,000 people in Detroit. And I kept saying, what was the number one thing? What was the number one thing? Mm -hmm. And of course, I thought it was gonna be early childhood, right? right? Mm -hmm. But their number one th thing was food access. Yes. Mm -hmm. We have to listen to that. That doesn't mean we're off track, but what it means is, you know, if we have people in this community that are still looking for basic needs at the bottom of Maslow's hierarchy, um, we have some issues that we need to deal with that we can't blame necessarily on the parent and the child. Uh, so that has to inform our work, and we have to think about how that gets embedded into the strategy. So every place, that's what we're trying to find, is where are the people, and then how do we build structures that help them move forward? If I may, uh, Mary, I'd like to uh, join in on that. Uh, we, I don't know if Kirk Mays is in the room. I saw him yesterday. He said he might come up from Forgotten Harvest. Kirk actually held this job before me and hog tied me, blindfolded me, and got me drunk. <laughs> and uh, I woke up and it's I called was called succession this planning. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, but as head of Forgotten Harvest, he told me, and I can't remember the number of how many tons of food, tons of food that they deliver to Brightmoor every year. The problem is, and this goes back to system, mm -hmm. there are some people who know about how to access mm -hmm. these resources. There are huge swatches of the community that we now understand don't. So part of our work at the community level is to make people aware of it. And what I would say to my sister and brother uh, human service organizations, while the planning work is going on, um, you can take what is your business uh, asset and look at ways in which this impacts early childhood. So, you know, we're a community development organization. We build block clubs. We are working through those block clubs to create word walks where we will bring the parents in, teach them 10 words for a tree on their street, and then ask them to walk with their children and encourage the children, tell me 10 words for that tree. We'll empower the parent before they go so they're not intimidated by this, using the Block Club Network as a method for doing that. You have innovative ways that you can take your work before the report comes out, because you all know this, and you can begin to start this work. When we say all hands on deck, these are the kind of things that I think help inform those who fund us and also helps us to get feedback from the neighborhood. This issue about food is real, but the truth is there is sufficient food. It's just not a system in place to get it to all the people who need it without shame. Yeah. Let me say that again, without shame, because people don't want to have to stand in a line a half a block long and have their children's friends drive past and see them waiting there to get food. So they will sit at home and try to find some other way to get it. These are real stories I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. So I think those are things that we can do as members of this uh, human service sector that can help this process even before the formal system is, is established. But you want to talk about all hands on deck and you know Larry's done on the food issue. We're going to have a, a partnership very uh, shortly with Michigan State University mm -hmm. to take a large stretch of vacant land in the Brightmoor neighborhood. Yes to demonstrate that you can use this land in a way that we could grow food, that the neighbors could potentially grow food yes. uh, for nutrition uh, in the neighborhood. And you think about the kind of creativity uh, that is going on. People are really good. They're pitching in, uh, but it, it takes much more leadership than it should have to take yes. uh, to get these done. But you know, when I listen to Luanna Simon talk with excitement about what she's doing in Brightmoor, yeah. Uh, you know how many people are trying to help. Yes. So one of the questions from the audience is, um, I'll say what the question is and then I'll twist it a little bit. Um, will the Hope Starts Here program extend to other communities in Wayne County? Hmm. Or, Mr. Mayor, is this an opportunity to make a magnet for young families to keep, hmm. not only keep people in Detroit, but actually bring people in? You know, I, I'm a great believer uh, that you execute before you brag. Uh, so before I announce that this program is a magnet, 
we we need to uh, we need to design it. Yeah. Uh, but here's what I found it over and over. Done a lot of different ways. Uh, passed uh, back in the 90s a millage uh, for buses and for the Save the Smart system to run throughout southeastern Michigan, what people thought was inconceivable. Once we laid out a plan and showed people what they got the voters of Wayne, Oakland, and Macomb County passed it with a 70% margin. And, and this is human nature. If, if the taxpayers of this state one way or another are gonna open their wallets, they wanna know what's the value they're getting for the money. And so before we start bragging about our output, we're gonna, we're gonna design a really good plan and, and I'm hoping a year from now, uh, we're sitting here saying this is why uh, we, think it, uh, we think it matters. And we're talking 30,000 kids in the city of Detroit. There are 80,000 kids, uh, I think up to third grade. 30,000 have no access to early child care, period, 30,000. So I agree with the mayor. We are trying to really build a, system, a systemic approach to serving these young children and making sure that they are entering kindergarten ready to go and at grade level by third grade. And when that is done, our vision is that it gets scaled all over the country because these disparities exist in almost every urban core and rural as well. And so you start by actually proving the concept and then the next part of the process would be how do you scale? And we hope that we get to levels of scale across this nation that will reach every child in America. Brip? Can I just sort of pound a, a nail into both of these points is that um, we just got to get started. Yeah. You know, I think the mayor said this earlier. Um, we can try to solve for the perfect. We can try to solve for the region. We can do lots of things. But to Lejeune's point, let's get some stuff in the ground, let's get some connective tissue built, let's get some funding innovation going. Uh, and I, I wouldn't understate how difficult that is. Um, it, 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 the, it, it, it's made more difficult and is helped by the fact that, as the mayor described, there is a whole other neighborhood-based agenda moving forward at lightning speed. It's housing, it's open space, it's basic services, and this is not completely unrelated to that. We've got to figure out a way that our early moves completely yeah. dovetail with that, and it's not just sort of meshing into the health system, it's not just meshing into the education system, it's meshing into the ebbs and the flows of daily life. How do these uh, systems help people in community uh, realize their lives more fully? I was talking to Ridgeway, right, who, um, Ridgeway, uh, is, as you all know, from the Mott Foundation, and they have a couple of issues up there that they're dealing with. And, but, um, but they started with an early childhood move a number of years ago, and despite sort of all the complexity of putting together a comprehensive, sort of state-of-the-art, community-engaged process, um, you know, they got something done. And it could have been easy to just sort of say, well, we're gonna deal with the water, or we're gonna deal with municipal, whatever municipal issues you got. Um, but they chose to really put a stake in the ground. I, I, I just want people in this room to know that we're really serious about this. We are gonna do this. And the more we can get the help of the business community, of the neighborhood community, of uh, the, the CDC community, the better. But we're gonna do this. This is, this is real, and I think it's the time to get it done. One of the things that I think um is intriguing about, about, about the description is this idea of having a qualified, trained, stable childcare workforce. And if, can we talk a little bit about who, what the profile of those childcare workers could, is, hmm. uh, and, and is, are these employment opportunities for Detroiters as well? I think there is definitely an employment opportunity. Uh, and one of the things that I've been able to do is because I'm also serving on the mayor's workforce development task force is to bring this conversation into that venue and to talk about, because we can create thousands, we're talking tens of thousands of jobs 
that are needed in order to serve these young people, and we need to build that workforce. And so that is an opportunity as we create the hundreds of thousands of jobs needed in the city of Detroit, and that is part of the plan to really think about how that happens and unfolds. Lejeune, say more about what that looks like. I mean, do you create certification programs in community colleges? Do you uh, try to deal with existing providers to sort of upgrade skills, to yeah. qualify for certificates? What do you do? Absolutely, and in fact, one of the things we've actually funded more nationally is creating a certification mm -hmm. for those uh, providers so that it, it not only allows them a new job opportunity, but it professionalizes it in a way where they can get a higher earning job. Because right now, uh, they're not, even the, the current providers, their per hour pay is below the poverty level. So we're not even providing a livable wage experience for those who are taking care of our most precious assets. So it is mm -hmm. creating a new structure that starts out with some certification, prepares them a career pathway and a ladder. They may want to go back and be a teacher one day, but creating that pathway. Larry, you want to just? I, I want to come back to these three messages that we've been talking about as we come to the end of today, because I think all of what we are saying kind of fits into one of these buckets. When we talk about this being unfinished business, uh, we have had phenomenal success and turnaround under Mayor Duggan uh, at multiple levels. Um, uh, I know Brighton more, but I've seen what's happened in other places. I am one of the expatriates who's back now as a patriot. I moved back into the city the day before yesterday. Mm -hmm. So, All right. <laughs> um, I am, uh, so, so this unfinished business, I want all of us to leave here with the understanding that there is a way for all you, for everybody here to plug into this process. There is a space somewhere for you because this business is unfinished and that's when we talk about all hands on deck and being inclusive. I don't think, you know, if Six Sigma is your thing or total quality management or baking cookies, it doesn't matter. There is a way to hook into this. So, this unfinished business, this inclusion, and then last but not least, this is good investment of money. And I, and I, and I wanna end there because one of, one of the moments of my public service life is I was part of a group that was trying to organize grandparents in early childcare, a union effort. Please don't, don't hold it against me. <laughs> Uh, but but the, 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 the motivation was good. The outcome might not have been. But the motivation was good. And I just want to say this about that. <laughs> These workers are some of the most underpaid yeah. folks in America. Yeah. From 90% of the child's brain is developed from zero to... Five years old. Everybody should have said five years old. Five years old. <laughs> Say that again, 90% of a child's brain is developed by five. 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 All right, I'll take three, I'll take five, either one. Lejeune, what's the answer? What is it? Five. It's 90% five. 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 is five. Five, five. all right. 85% is three. Right, five. <laughs> and the people we pay to do that make a dollar 85 cents an hour. Yeah. What? The people we pay to develop that capacity oh. get paid a dollar 85 an hour. Mm. Yeah. That public policy must change. Mm. There's something for all of us to do. Three things, unfinished business, a great public investment, and all hands on deck. And so as, as we ask, you for this. This is a pretty unusual kind of a forum, which is basically we're here to tell you we're going to start or working on solving a problem, which isn't normally uh, what we do. But the fact that you showed up yeah. means that you have an interest. And, and if you have an idea, you have something inside you, what uh, Lejeune and Rip have done is, is say this. If we were going to design a world where you take a child from before he or she is born, 
to the time they enter kindergarten. And we were gonna have everything, every resource as a community in that child's life, what would those pieces be? And they're gonna put this plan together. And, and they're not here saying we got the answers. They're saying over the next year we're gonna develop the answers. Anybody here who wants to play a role in that, who has an idea on how to have a role in that, that's why we're here is to tell you this is the journey we're starting on. I hope a year from now we're here telling you a compelling vision of where we've come, but we're saying this journey is open to everybody, and if they want to sign up with you, what do they do? Call Lejeune. Yeah. 1-800-LEJEUNE. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to say that this train has left the station. There are hundreds of people working with us now on strategy teams developing the recommendations for how we move forward. And those will be uh, distributed throughout the entire city later this summer. So, uh, and everyone else who is interested, there's a website, and what's the name of our website? Hope Starts Here. Hope Starts Here. Detroit. 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 So uh, plug into it because there's a lot of information there. You'll be able to access all of the feedback we've gotten from parents and residents, but the strategy teams have been working hard. And I just want to say again, this isn't you know one body coming up with an answer. It's yeah. been hundreds of people, different sectors, the healthcare sector, the, the financing sector, the you know, facilities, and so they're all trying to understand how all of this is interconnected. And the recommendations are going to be connected in a way where it shows us how to create a new system. And it's, unfortunately, there aren't many places around this country that actually has an early childhood system that's right. that feeds the K-12 system in a way that's productive and effective. That's what we're talking about, but the work is underway and many people have engaged and many more will. So these are on your table. You should be taking these with you. And I guess in closing, I want to um, go back to when I asked who was in the room. And this is the Detroit Regional Chamber Policy Conference. So yes. assuming that this is a lot of business people, they were the smallest segment in the audience. In closing, how, mm. what do we need from business and how do we get more business people engaged in this, in this initiative. Yeah. Okay, I can tell you, when we did this in uh, Minnesota, I'm sorry to keep going back to that, but when we did this in Minnesota, for good or for ill, the business community delivered it. And people like Rick DeVore, DNC, and others uh, right at, at uh, Henry Ford um, have an enormous outsized role to play, and, and they have been playing it. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that what, what I would hope is that the business community would figure out how to speak with one voice on this. Yeah. It, it, we can figure out lots of different solution types, but the, the importance of it, the need to move forward with it, the need to embed it in state policy, I think uh, we can all deliver that message from all of our platforms, but I think particularly the business community has, has got to step up. And so uh, talk to Rick, because I think he has a bunch of ideas about how that could be done. So. We're out of time, and I just want to thank the panel and thank you for your good questions and your attention today. Hope does start here, and you'll hear more about it by the June, Rip, August? Uh, yes. Yeah, yeah. August. <laughs> so thank you very yes. much for your yes. coming today. Yeah.